Our next author, um, Mondiant Dogon, is the author of Those We Throw Away Are Diamonds. Mondiant is an author, a human rights activist, and a refugee ambassador. Born into a Congolese Tutsi family in Bagagwe tribe in North Kivu province, at age three, he was forced to leave his home village, Bikinke, because of the Rwandan genocide against Tutsis that spilled over into the Democratic Republic of Congo. From 1996, he lived in refugee camps. Dogon holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Rwanda and a master's in international education from New York University. He now lives in New York where he directs the Mondian Initiative, a foundation for refugees that focuses on unlocking their potential through education and empowerment. Jessica Godot, author of After the Last Border, says about those we throw away are diamonds. It is an immersive, riveting look at one Bagagwe man's singular journey from war in Congo to safety, in which good and evil are relative when war offers no choices to anyone, when safety is an illusion, and when forgiveness is fraught. It is an uncompromising study in colonial powers as the root cause of rising displacement after centuries of redrawing boundaries, fomenting ethnic crises, and robbing regions of natural resources. But even as it offers high level international context, the book remains focused on the people whose lives are destroyed by war and policies, by disinterest and pity. Mondian Dogon writes the stories of his community with such candor, compassion and love that they can never be erased. I know that I will never forget them. You and your students also will not forget them once you've had a chance to read this powerful and inspiring book. Please join me in welcoming Mondiant Dogon. Thank you so much, Spencer, for the wonderful introduction. My name is Mondiant Chimimane Dogon, as Spencer said in the introduction. I am one of 16 million people who are in protracted refugee situation. And this category represent around 78% of all the refugees displaced worldwide. Maybe some of you don't know what a protracted refugee means. The Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, defines a protracted refugee situation as one in which 25,000 or more refugees from the same nationality have been in exile for five, year, for five or more years in a given asylum country. For example, Syrian refugees in Turkey are in protected refugee situation. The Burmese in Thailand, the Colombians in Venezuela, millions of Afghan refugees have been living in Pakistan for four decades and millions more recently displaced, displaced will almost certainly become in a protected situation as they as go by without a change and are called as the forever refugees. I was born in Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo in a very small village called Bikenke. Life was very beautiful. We didn't have electricity. We didn't have running water or hospitals, but we were mostly joyful and we lived with purpose. We had jobs to do. Those of us who were old enough took turns working on the farm taking care of the cattle and take, attending to vegetables and food. Young children, children like me got captivated by my grandmother's wisdom and listening, listening to her stories, fables, when we were sitting around the fire. But three years after I was born, everything completely changed. I remember very well, it was in late afternoon, 1995, when a friend of my dad who was a Hutu came to our door and told my family that we were going to be killed within an hour. We immediately fled our home village and started roaming through the forest of Eastern Congo. Our walk to the border of Rwanda were not easy at all. Some of my family members were, were killed. My uncle Karasira was beheaded in front of me while he was holding my hand. And my aunt and cousins were burnt alive while we were watching from the hill we were hiding. The stories of how people become refugees are well known. They may be, they appear in newspaper headlines. They are the images of people walking the Giza or everybody I think have seen photos or videos of young people from Africa, like Libya crossing the ocean or sea, going to, uh, to Europe for searching a better life. And uh, all these stories 
are showing the hardships and the life of people, refugees who like me, who are searching for the better life. And uh, the tens of tens of millions of refugees in the world may be separated by culture, uh, language, or geography, but we share those stories. We all share those stories. At that moment, when we stop being who we are or who we were in our home and became refugees, it is when the stories become less well known and when they fade from the headlines that we become, that's when we become forever refugees. And we beg the world to remember us. When we arrived in Rwanda in 1996, our life completely flipped. In the camp, uh, my family and I faced many challenges. We were always hungry. We withstood illness, pregnancy, injury, uh, without access to medical services. Many of our neighbors hated us because we were refugees. And for the same reason, we had to fight to work and go to school. I grew up in a refugee camp called Gihembe, which is located in northern province of Rwanda. In Gihembe, I lived in a white UN, UN, UN tent, then a handmade, uh, a handmade brick structure with a tent as a door, then a home with a swinging tiny door with the UN tent as a, man, as a martini in front. I learned to be grateful for and to hate that tent. I learned that when you look at the same things every day, a sea or ocean of white tents, your mind change, it becomes numb. I learned that being hungry is the worst feeling in the world. It was in Gihembe that I, I also made some of my best friends. We play soccer with whatever we could find, banana leaves strunched and tied together, a deflated ball squad from the trash of our host community. And wherever there was space, I shared my single moment with them while I was still in Gihembe. And many of them are still there. Many of them were born in refugee camp and will, will die in refugee camp. They will be hungry till they will be hungry their entire lives. So I think, can you imagine the world we all live in? In Gihembe, I learned that hunger does to people, uh, what, what hunger does to people, even children. I promised to my family, my parents, I would never steal, but hunger made me break my promise. Uh, but even after running security guard, Kennedy can my legs and my friend's leg when they caught us talking, taking a uh, passion fruit from a farm. I try not to scream or make noise because we didn't want anybody to know why we were being beaten. Only the shame of stealing could feel worse than hunger. In him, I learned that every parent, no matter where they live or under what circumstances, we do for we do anything for their children to have a better lives. Like my mother or my father, every parent will sacrifice anything they can do to send their children to school. When you have nothing, the promise of an education allows you to dream. Going to school outside of the camp was extremely difficult. Most of the refugee I grew up with could not find a small fee needed to pay for school supplies or uniform or school fees. Some couldn't physically make the work from the camp to the school, Otherwise, others dropped out, of, uh, dropped out when they faced the cruelty of students who realized we were refugees. I stayed in school and eventually graduated from the best university in Rwanda, in Kigali, capital city of Rwanda. This is partly because my family who gave, who gave up so much to make sure I stayed in school. It is partly because of my own determination. It's partly because of a miracle, a series of miracles that always seemed to catch me at my worst moment. Not everything can be explained. And I made it through the school and life in Gihembe because I started writing. I wrote about life and the lives of other forever refugees. And in 2013, I started to write a book about my life. And also, I was also writing poetry. One of those poems, Those We Throw Away Are Diamonds, became the title of my book. I lived in refugee camp until 2017 when another miracle took me to NYU. Before then, uh, other than through the running friends I made in school, I had no idea what the life was like outside of refugee camp. My world was changing dramatically, but inside of my head were still just endless rows of white tents. In New York, I kept writing my book, Those We Throw Away Diamond. Now, 
I wrote to tell my story and to feel connected to the tens million of refugees searching the world for uh, a better life. And uh, we can see a lot of people, like people fleeing from people fleeing conflict or poverty in the Middle East, Central America, and East Africa. I wrote because I want to tell readers what is really happening on the other side of the globe in the places most of them have never been or may never go. I want them to know what it's really like to be a refugee your entire life or your entire life, or to worry that you will remain a refugee your entire life, or maybe you grew up in refugee camp and you stay there for 10 or 20 years. I hope to that by publishing a book with a, a, a big US publishing company, I could reach many of those people. And I wanted the people to know my story and the stories of millions of people like me. When I was at NYU, I realized that my book my help, might help young people in high school or college to not take things for granted. It took me two or three days to get to my high school from Gehembe. The walk was long and very dangerous, but I knew I would have walked twice as far as through even great danger to get to Apem High School. Going to school was the only way to really leave Gehembe behind. I want, young, I want young people here in America or all over the world to read my book and see the world in new ways. There is more to life than what we can see from our front doors. We can learn from others whose life is nothing like ours. And even from those whose lives would never want. I want people to read my book and have empathy and understanding of people who are different from them. I hope that when they realized what others have accomplished despite their circumstances, they will feel encouraged to dream and to live for a purpose and to make this world a better place for everyone who lives on it. That's why I started my nonprofit organization called Mono Initiative to help these young refugees in Africa to attend higher education and also helping women and girls to share their stories. And, um, I want to tell you guys that refugees don't just leave a place. We leave a thousand memories, a million dream to save our life, and we leave our home as well. Forever refugees live their entire lives without even finding home again. I want the world to see us. It is the obligation. I believe that it is the obligation of every person born in a safer room to open the door when somebody in danger knocks. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening.